to the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Korpodian. Welcome back to Unleash Success. This is your host, Corey Korpodian. Today, we have the honor of interviewing Barney Waters, who is the president of K-Swiss. K-Swiss has been around for 50 years, but they are revolutionizing the industry right now with a recent partnership with Gary Vee, providing shoes and sneakers for young entrepreneurs and hustlers. Barney, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. I love the culture that you've created in this company. And you know, as the president of K-Swiss, you're really running a shoe company, but a lot of young entrepreneurs out there want to run their own company. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you kind of were an entrepreneur for the right. company as opposed to a full-blown entrepreneur, but why you really appreciated that. Yeah, I think I've always been a company guy. I've always worked for, for companies, both big and small. Um, and th that's just been the way it was. I, I, I lucked into a really great company in the UK where I, where I grew up called Lotus, and they were headquartered in Cambridge, and I moved to America with them. Uh, way back when, 20 some years ago, uh, but just a really successful company, really progressive and really smart people that I was around. So when I was really young, I was surrounded by just great people in a company that was successful, which set up, I think, my whole career of, you know, just the, I had a great base of, um, of learning from them. And then I, as I moved into the sneaker business, I moved, I worked for, for Puma, Oh, cool. Uh, in Boston. And again, a company that was really growing fast and just surrounded by great people, super dynamic and learned a ton. So I, I think I just was lucky to be in some great situations where I was able to really benefit from being in a company. And then when I was ready to sort of do my own thing or felt like, hey, I could do, I could do more, I could take more of the reins, uh, I found an opportunity to come to California and K-Swiss at the time had acquired a smaller shoe company. It was called Palladium Boots. And I came actually to run Palladium originally and to b rebuild that brand. And I remember asking the K-Swiss people who were recruiting say, and said like, okay, let me, I remember Palladium because it's an old heritage boot brand, but you know, show me what's the website so I can do some research. And they said, we don't have one. Wow. Um, they said, in fact, we haven't got anything. We just got the old original shoe on the wall in the office. We don't ever have a shoe box. Um, so I thought, wow, that's a great opportunity. So that starting was from scratch, starting from scratch. So I think, you know, the Palladium situation was, was, you know, it wasn't my company, but it was as entrepreneurial as it gets in that there was like three of us, I think, originally rebuilding wow. this and, um, we built it to just over a hundred million dollars. And then eventually, and then I got, I said, they said, Hey, why don't you guys go upstairs and, and take a go at K-Swiss, the mother brand. And, uh, and so that's what got me onto K-Swiss. So I think I've, I've been in, in big companies or you know, medium-sized companies, but I've found my way into situations that are very entrepreneurial. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's turnaround situations, either, either fast growth or turnaround situations where you know, you're in the same situation as entrepreneurs or startups, which is like small resources, you know, you against the world mentality, yeah. everything's on the line, not a lot of money to spend, and uh, blood, sweat, and tears required. So I think you can find the same comparable situations to entrepreneurship uh, if you pick the right companies. You need, you, first of all, you need the right, right company to work for, and then, and I always say sort of go for brand names if possible, mm -hmm. because it, it kind of, it looks, gives you much more access than, than a random company. And then within those, can you find the right team that will nurture new people and help them learn? Yeah, I think having the right mentors is critical to success in any area of life. Yeah. And especially if you're trying to hone in some skills, because a lot of people might be thinking about, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur. And sometimes they say, I don't know where to start. And you, a lot of us have skills, hit, kind of hidden talents and everything that we can focus on. But understanding how to run a business yeah. is a lot different than having a talent or a skill. And so finding the right mentor for business so that you don't make a lot of mistakes. And yeah. one of the reasons why we do this podcast is to kind of help avoid those yeah. mistakes. Um, so I, I love what you talk about entrepreneurship because a lot of people here might not have quit their job yet, yeah. and they, but they want to be an entrepreneur. So you can still be an entrepreneur 
inside a company. Yeah, if you find the right situations and you know you've put yourself into the right companies that are that that are dynamic, that give you opportunities to make decisions. You know that's important. You could easily get bogged down in a in a thankless job at the, at right. the with with a small cog in the wheel. So you need to find situations where you've got a company that will give people decision making um, power, or you've got to earn your way and earn the trust of people. This is what I did: is sort of earned it through just results slowly and surely over the years to be at a point where they're like, okay, we're gonna listen to you now. You know, you earned our trust and you get the keys. So, uh, you know, there's a few different, d different parts of how you get to that situation. You can't just walk into a corporation and be like, hey, I wanna make all the, I wanna be the creative director. Right. You know. And I heard you say something too once, it's just like, if you're not happy if, what, with what you're doing, then you should change it, Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, at bottom line is, you know, is to analyze your situation. Are you happy doing what you're doing? Um, you know, I've often thought, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm in this entrepreneur culture now. Um, every day, I, all I hear is people talk, and myself talking about entrepreneurship, and people look at me like, why don't you do your own thing? Well, I have my own sneaker brand right now that someone's tr entrusted in me. Um, I'm using their financial resources, and I get to, I haven't having a great time. You know, I love the company. I love the journey of what I'm doing. I love being in this culture. The team I work with is great. Like, why would I mess with this right now? You, you know, so I think, I think there's a, a strong sort of um, voice out there about, hey, do your, you know, start today, do your thing. But grass isn't always greener. If you don't like what you're doing, then absolutely you should start today. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because there's that quote where entrepreneurs are the people that will work 80 hours a week so they don't have to work 40 hours a week for somebody else. That's right, yeah. And, you know, I, I understand that. I think that that's one of the biggest things about entrepreneurship is kind of the freedom. Um, but for you, like, I know you're, you love sneakers and this is an exciting venture. So it's like when you're doing something you absolutely love and you're in control and you're running your own company, yeah. um, it, it gives you a lot of freedom in to yeah. be able to express yourself. I also think that not everybody is an entrepreneur, okay? Everybody likes the idea of it, but you know, being an entrepreneur is, and being a successful one takes a certain mindset, okay? And not everybody has it. And, if, and, and, and by the way, if you are that mindset where you're like, hey, I, I don't wanna listen to anybody else, I wanna make all the decisions and I wanna you know, drive everything myself, then you're not gonna do well in a company. Those people, you know, right. that is not a good uh, you know, person to have in a team environment. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and similarly, if you're not, if you, if you don't like risk, and if you prefer being in the in the in the in the safety of a, of a team, then you may not like the, being an entrepreneur. and might be happier staying where you are. So I think it's worth understanding like what it really takes in terms of the personality type, and ask yourself: Is that really you? You know, you've got to like risk. You know, you've got to be a great connector, a networker. Um, you've got to have a lot of self belief. You've got to be really persistent. You know, you've got to like a no. You've got to hear ten no's and be able to go back for the eleventh. You know, are you that person, or are you the person that someone says no three times? And you're like, well, you know, it was it, worth a try. <laughs> it was worth a try. I gave it. A, I gave it a good go. Right. You may not be cut out for it. So not everybody's necessarily, um, you know, ready to to be an entrepreneur. But I think we're we're, and I'm part of this, creating this sort of vision of. Every, anything is possible, and it's true, it is possible, but you know, ultimately I think you've got to be happy, and, and, then it, and it can pay to go get the skills first. So I remember a, a, a builder, uh, when I was a kid, there was a, a friend who was gonna be a general contractor to build houses, yeah. and he said, I'm gonna first go and be, the, be a bricklayer, then I'm gonna be a plasterer, then I'm gonna be a plumber, then I'm gonna be, you know, so by the time I become a, a general contractor, I know everybody's jobs, and I know when they're pulling a fast one or when the pricing is right or the job's done right because I've done every job. And right. it's similar, you know, if you're gonna be, go run a business, maybe, you know, spending a little time, you know, understanding each of those facets of business, whether it be supply chain, finance and accounting, marketing, product development, social media, you know, there's, and you can learn those skills in a, in a company environment and then be way more prepared to do your own thing. Absolutely. Uh, so I wanna switch gears a little bit and the revolution that you're creating right now, I, I love because we talked a little bit about how these big brands like Nike and Adidas go after you know, celebrities and um, athletes. Yeah. And so 
you decided to go after entrepreneurs. Right. And that was going to be kind of like your Michael Jordan. And you chose Gary Vee, great guy. I love him. I've been yep. following him for years. Uh, like a match made in heaven. And, you know, the clouds and dirt line is yep. just absolutely fantastic. And yeah, that's another you. way how I found out about K-Swiss again. I said, right. like, I used to have a pair in 1999, 2000. Like, yep. I'm actually feeling a little bit older these days now. But <laughs> it's like, it's amazing to have this comeback. So I want to know, what was your inspiration for choosing entrepreneurs? Well, first of all, I think the, the main lesson learned was to find an open lane. And in the sneaker business, when you're facing, you know, I, I, I describe it as a Coke and Pepsi industry. It's like we have Nike and Adidas, it's like Coke and Pepsi. So if you come to market with a cola, um, you, you, you know, you're in, that looks and feels like theirs, um, that's targeted at the same people, you're, you're really up against it, especially if you're a percentage of their size and power. So when you're in this industry, I, I quickly realized that the biggest, strongest competitor is all about athletics and, and, and athletes as their, as their focus. So I knew I couldn't win if I tried to do that. Right. And so to be a sports brand is like you're guaranteeing yourself best case, maybe number two. But in reality for us, it was maybe 10th if we nail it. And that's just not a good situation. So I think everybody wants to start a business, but first thing to do is look at the market and look at who the incumbents are and say, can I really win? And if not, then maybe pick a different fight. Yeah. Or you're banging your head against a wall. At the same time, Adidas had shifted and was really talking about rappers and celebrities as their, as their sort of brand muse um, or creatives now. And it stole a lot of thunder from Nike, you know, because the truth is that that athlete thing looked a bit old fashioned when Adidas started working with Kanye and he, they, they had a lot of success the past couple of years. Yeah, especially like, with Instagram influencers and everything, you course, know, if a celebrity yeah. posts a picture and every, like everybody would buy it, right? That's so. right. So I realized again that if I get into this who can sign the biggest celebrity game, I'm setting my, I don't have the budget. So if I play by Adidas's rules, they set those rules. So by playing their game, I. Yeah. The rules are set against me, right? So I would say that, you know, like a Puma is, or, or maybe a Reebok is competing on who's got the most, who can sign the most famous people. Under Armour's competing with Nike on who's the most athletic. And I would get killed if I take any of them on any of those with, my, with where my brand is today. So right over here is an open lane, which not only is it open, but it's also real. So that's the other thing is, the truth is that young people now are aspiring to be entrepreneurs. Right. And if you talk to young people, you'll find that it's true. They're just, they're trying to build their own businesses. They're trying to be successful. It's cool to be smart now, you know, and it's like the Mark Zuckerberg eff uh, effect, you know, like the nerdy kids in school used to get picked on. Now everyone's nice to them because they're probably going to work for them one day. <laughs> I mean, it's happening. Every time you right. turn around, somebody's just start doing a startup, it's a hundred million dollars. You're just like, Whoa. okay. So listen, if I want to get you, I'm not gonna to wear my shoes or to uh, not wear my shoes, but like if I want you to buy into my brand, you know, I'm not gonna talk to you about. Can I skim thirty seconds off your mile pace? Can't tell you the last time I ran a mile. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, yeah. But if I said to you, hey, like, let me inspire you to be a better entrepreneur, you're like, okay, I'm listening. So right. we're not targeting a different person. It's the same person. It's just that we're using a different voice that I believe is way more aligned to the truth of what they're thinking. And it just also happens to be an open lane. So that's a really good strategy right there is picking something that is an untapped market. Yeah. Right? You know, you basically you did a land grab on entrepreneurs and created a signature signature shoe line for them, which yeah. I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's ever been done before you guys. I don't think so, not as specific. And, I, and also I called it sneakers for CEOs. You know, that was the sort of term I used to make it really clear. You know, sneakers for athletes, you want to run fast, Nike is your brand. Sneakers for celebrities or cool, cool people, uh, sneakers for CEOs. Which one do you want to be? Right. You know, and everyone's like, I want to be that one. For because CEOs. It's money. These days it's fame and status, uh, you know, whether it's Elon Musk or, yeah. you know. Um, and these are people driving culture and changing the world, really. So. I think it's become this, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are our heroes now and are sort of rock stars of, of culture. So um, I think that's what we've lined up, we've lined up to. And I don't think anybody had done it. And so to sort of further cement it, you know, the idea was create a signature sneaker for an entrepreneur, which was like almost to me, it was the perfect juxtaposition to the athlete positioning, which where the formula is sneaker plus athlete is a signature sneaker. 
Okay. Right. Yeah. The, you know, with the Jordan being the most famous. Right. right. Uh, and now every you know any great NBA player has a signature sneaker. Right. right. Um, so I was like, what if we made one for an entrepreneur? And it was almost like, not a joke, but it's like it would make people go, wait, what? So and that's what we did. Right. Right. <laughs> Okay, so... <laughs> and people did notice. Before you even get this idea, of course people are going to notice because it's, it's like it's so out of the box. Yeah. Before you get this idea, how do you overcome, you know, the pushback internally? Because I got to imagine people were like, what, are you yeah. crazy? Yeah. yeah. How do you handle that? You know, like I got to imagine there was some self-doubt, like am I, is this idea For even sure, good? Yeah. Yep. So how do you battle that and then still have the, the belief to keep pushing forward? Yeah, so I think you always have to first convince yourself. You know, there's like a, it's like a pyramid of, of buy-in. First it's you, then it's your team internally. You know, in our case, it's then a retail buyer, and then it's the consumer, okay? So you've got, you kind of, it's no point me just going straight out to the consumer and saying, hey, do you buy into this? I've got to start with like, okay, is this something I'm ready to go all in on? And there was a ton of risk involved for me personally, but I just really believed it. That's the bottom line. Is like I, the more I thought about it, I'm like, I know this is the this is an opportunity. Why, why did you believe it so much? Just because I'm on top of what's got, you know. I just I'm really soaking in culture all the time. You know, I'm just I'm always involved in what's going on, whether it's politics, current events, culture, fashion, sneakers, music. You know, I've always been hungry like that, yeah. and ear to the ground. Uh, even as I got older, I never lost that, which is. Yeah, it's a jo- that's my joy is being involved in all that stuff. I just was aware of what was going on. I've always been able to kind of, I suppose, read a little bit about people. Yeah, and and and, and seeing shifts of what people are into. Right. I just believed it because I could see it. I guess. So, so. Yeah, I mean, if you look at just you know entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur is a buzzword. Hustle, you know, yeah. grind twenty four seven. These are things that people always you know kind of push out there yeah. as it, it's grown in popularity significantly over yeah. i think in the age of the internet because it's so easy sure. and, to be and, able to come become an entrepreneur yourself yeah. and i and i think when i started with this concept it wasn't maybe as big as it is now because i'm going back to two and a half years um so the next layer of that of that com- convincing pyramid was my own team and you're absolutely right it was it was very difficult i mean some people were like oh yeah i see it it's great a lot of people didn't and yeah. um, it took a long time to convince my own team that this was the right thing to do. And, and, and what I learned was that talk is cheap. You know, I was spending a lot of time telling people, hey, this is great, this is great, but you ought to really show people something tangible. And it wasn't until we did our first, you know, signed Gary V, developed a shoe. So I'm, this is a, takes a long time, so I'm yeah. jumping real forward for, for a second here. We did a launch event and it was a Gary V launch event um, in uh, at a store on Melrose Avenue in Hollywood. And bear in mind, a lot of people on my teams didn't know who he was. Really? Yeah. I mean, he was. This is going back a couple of years. You know, I he guess, was. Yeah. He was not what he is today. I mean, he was. You, you, people knew him, but he not like it is today. Yeah. A lot of my own team didn't know who he was, or they knew because I told them. Well. I mean, 500 people showed up and were waiting outside the store. It was like a mob scene. And it was just this amazing event of positivity, of consumer excitement. And that's when people believe. People came into work the next day different than the day before. And they like, I could see in their eyes, they're like, okay, I'm in now. And I, and I was, man, I wish I'd have done that a year ago. And, and yeah. you know what I mean? So talk is cheap. You've got to show something, not just, Absolutely. people won't believe you. People will nod at you even, but until they see it with their own eyes and, and, and experience it, you're, you're not going to get people. And I learned that now. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's so funny. I, when I went through my own personal transformation, I remember I was telling all these people about the strategies I was using. They're like, and I'm like, I feel really happy, though. Like, I feel a lot better since I've been doing all this stuff. I'm talking about emotional fitness, yeah. right? Just mindset, awareness, yeah. and, and understanding the power of my thoughts and shifting my whole life. And uh, everybody's like, yeah, Corey, that's cool. And then six months later, uh, basically doubled my income while working less. I bought my dream home and I got my girlfriend. And I was like, they're like, wait a second. What was that emotional fitness you yeah, were talking yeah, about? Yeah. Like they, they see they all see the it things. Now. It's tangible. Right. And yeah. so I understand when you do that, you know, and I've always believed that uh, actions speak louder than words. Yeah. So, well, in today's day and age, it's about kind of documenting the journey and everything. But also, too, like if you don't follow through with the action, yeah. you know, 
that's what really makes a statement. Yeah. Um, so I think action speaks louder than words is probably the lesson that I could have used back then that I know now. But we, hey, we made it through, and I, I think that, that it's been successful, but that would be my Well, my apparently, I mean, you guys sh shut down the website because you sold so many shoes in the first yeah, minute it was right, launched. That's uh, right. That's yeah. pretty, right. It's pretty incredible. Uh, real quick, too, because as an, on, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, one of the things I heard that you said is you just cold emailed Gary V yeah. and and kind of pitched him on this idea. Yeah. But you know that that's pretty uh, inspirational because I like I'd reach out to a lot of people, but sometimes people are afraid to reach out. Yeah. Why did you just pick Gary V and and how did that transpire? Well, I was looking for a while of who could bring this position to life about young entrepreneurship, and it was really difficult to find someone who was culturally relevant, i.e., cool and young and someone that kids want to look up to or want to dress like and someone who was a real entrepreneur. I just, I couldn't come up with anyone. I could come up with some great entrepreneurs um, and I could come up with some great culturally re relevant people but I couldn't find the combination. I mean, the, probably the one I lo really thought is that guy is someone like Pharrell. Oh yeah. Um, but he was, he had just done a big deal with Adidas and, and has since done really well with that. So, but he's a guy that I think is credibly can pull off being a business brain and a, you know, uh, and, he, and he's super cool. Yeah. So I, w I just couldn't come up with it. And this guy, Gary Vee, kept coming up in my searches. It's like, he is the guy who's living this and talking yeah. about it. And he's the voice on social media. So, but I was like, wow, you know, he's a 40 year old guy. He doesn't look like right. what I think an influencer is. Okay, but the more I kept coming back to him, I'm like, well, he's influencing. That's when I reached out. So eventually I'm like, it's undeniable that he is that guy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, yeah, I cold emailed. Um, and again, Gary was, I think he maybe had 600,000 followers back then on Instagram. Now he has four and a half million. Right. So we've sort of grown with him. But so I guess I called him a little early. Um, and, and of course, I had a great pitch. So I had, do you want to make a sneaker? Now, nine times out of 10, if you can get someone to read that sentence, they're going to be interested, right? Who doesn't want their own sneaker? So I think I definitely had that on my side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, made, I didn't go into the brand's history and the blah, 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 and this is who I am, and I was born as, in a, as a young child in the coal mines <laughs> of England, and I just Or else like, you might not have ever read the actual exactly. important part. Hey, do you want to be the first guy to have a signature sneaker for an entrepreneur? Done. Done. And he, 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 they wrote back real fast, yeah, let's do it. And so, really? so we, we met and, and you know, the rest is history. And yeah, the first time we actually bought that sneaker to market, we launched it at midnight. The website crashed at 12.01, which was a, is a fun story, but it's not a good look. Um, <laughs> especially when you're this old brand working with a dynamic new audience and they're like, oh, typical, <laughs> you know. Uh, was, it, was it a struggle to get over that little bump right there? Or people were just so excited about it, they kind of were like, Yeah, oh. I think we got away with it that time. I mean, we didn't do ourselves any favors by having that happen, to be honest. And I, you know, but also seeing that success was what enabled us as a company to make the right investments to get it right the next time. Right. So again, you know, actions speak louder than words. Hey, the website, we, we put so much traffic to the, to the website that the website keeled over. We haven't done that in years. So let's upgrade the plumbing. Yeah. And then yeah. that's an easy sign off. So, I mean, that was a huge success and just incredibly innovative as well. Um, I was wondering if we can go into what is your brand message and maybe some of the top, like top three things that you have done to change this brand from what it was to what it is now. Yeah. And so that, you know, anybody out there building their own brand can kind of use those tools and strategies as well. Yeah, I think the first thing I did is I really honed in on the authentic history of K-Swiss, which is a tennis brand. It's an, it's, an, it's an old tennis brand, and it was founded in Southern California. So I used three words, heritage American tennis. And because I knew we were authentically from 1966, which is a differentiator to modern sneaker brands, yeah. and people appreciate that history, we were American. And other heritage brands were French, like Lacoste or Fred Perry is English. So I knew that we, American was also a differentiator. And then tennis was a specialization. You know, if I said I'm a general sports brand, now you're putting me up against Nike and Adidas again. If I say I'm just a tennis brand, my competitive set is shrunk. And then when I say I'm a heritage tennis brand, I get rid of all the kind of modern racket companies. And then when I say I'm a heritage American tennis brand, it's just me. 
So you niche down really, right. really exactly. small. Exactly. Yeah. Specialize to give yourself a wedge, like a reason to exist. I'm the only something. Yeah. Okay, so I go to a retailer and say, hey, you know, white sneakers are hot right now. I'm the only heritage American tennis brand, so you've got to have me in the mix. That's a much better story than being the fifth something or, hey, here's why I'm better, slightly different than all these million of other options you have. Right. Like, I'm the only one of this. So I would say answer that question, that I'm the only something. And if you can't, then you haven't quite got a clear path. And that gives you a wedge. And once you can establish yourself, then you can diversify over time yeah. and, and, and expand into the, bigger, into the bigger business. So number one, we did that is like put blinkers on and said, and we, 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 we divested from the running business. We took ourselves out of some categories and, and, and narrowed it down. And then since then, we've then added this modern um, brand story around young entrepreneurship. So that was phase two was once we kind of got back in our lane as a, as a heritage American tennis brand, everyone was like, okay, yeah, that's what I thought you were. We go to retailers and say, hey, we're a heritage American tennis brand. They're like, yeah, we know. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, good. You, you're back in your lane. Once we'd established that um, credibility again, then we were like, hey, you know, we're going to evolve that too and modernize it into this position around entrepreneurship. And everyone was accepting of that. So those are the two you know, two facets or two sides of the coin of the brand was the heritage backstory and what does it stand for today? Yeah. What is your message to your customer right now? You know, the young hustlers, the entrepreneurs, like why would we want to wear K-Swiss? I think that that says a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, we're, we're creating, um, you know, first of all, I want to be the brand that is con that re you can relate to in terms of how we're talking about what you're going through. So those, if I talk to you about, hey, this shoe's gonna add six inches to your vertical, or this shoe's gonna make you run faster, or this right. shoe's um, what all the cool kids are wearing, you know, someone may or may not relate to that. But if I say, hey, this shoe is for hustlers who are trying to make their best life, and this shoe, you know, they're gonna be like, okay, that relates to me. So number one, I wanna say like, we're the brand that's gonna relate to you because we're thinking the same way as you if you're someone who is trying to either be an entrepreneur or it can relate to that spirit. You may be in a company, you may not even have a job, you may be a student, but yeah. you've got that mindset. We're gonna to talk to you in a way you can understand. Then we have to create product that's purpose built for that life. So that's the thing we're doing now is we're realizing there are certain aspects of an entrepreneur's 24 seven um, that we can build shoes for, whether that's all day comfort, whether it's versatility for multiple situations, like you, you're gonna go to the office, but then you've gotta take a client out for a drink and you're, you're not gonna go home in between, so can something do both of those situations? Yeah. These are things that, you know, hey, these entrepreneurs over-index in travel. They travel more. You know, I travel a lot, and when you take your shoes off on an airplane for a long ride, when you get to your destination, your feet are twice the size, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, you <laughs> that moment, okay, can I solve that problem for someone? Um, you know, now if I, if I go out and say, hey, this shoe does this, someone's gonna say, that's me. Yeah, so you guys are really focusing on entrepreneurs and young hustlers, and how has it been, you know, obviously Gary Vee's kind of like your celebrity endorser or endorsement, and how has it been getting the awareness out? Like, how are you guys really building the brand under this new Well, Gary's title? a built-in, advertising engine you know yeah. that's the what's so unique is if I sign a deal with an athlete I'm gonna get they're gonna wear my shoes on court and I might get a tweet or a contractual three tweets that they may or may not do right you know I may get a five-hour window to shoot an ad campaign they may or may not end up honoring you know I've done these deals before oh, wow. it's like you, you know when you it's not easy okay Gary is the ultimate partner because he's coming to us and saying, hey, can, can we do another event? Wow. Hey, I wanna talk to my audience in Canada. I feel like I haven't given them an opportunity to kind of either to get the shoes. Can we go to Toronto and do something? So we went to Toronto and did an event. Wow. Um, he's delivering more than you asked for. That's awesome. So it's so unique. And of course he is a built in, he, he comes with the endorsement, but then he's, his voice socially is yeah. is the activation. If there's one thing too about Gary Vee, if you ever, you know, when you follow him on Instagram and, and watch his videos, he gets so much engagement. Yeah. 
but he's also a little bit divisive. Uh-huh. You know, some people love him. I love him. Yeah. And some people don't. They're like, eh, you know, he's a, yep. he says fuck a lot. You know, it's yeah. like he's, he's not, he's really kind of brass and just yeah. like coarse. Yeah, um, not everybody's cup of tea. Yep. Yeah. So do you think that's helped you or hurt you? And what, did you think about that before you made the decision? Well, you have to think about that. Yeah. You know, when you sign an influencer, and especially if it's your only one, then one false move from that person is, has an imp- impact on your brand. And you right. see that happen a lot where one tweet that goes the wrong way oh my God, can yeah. end a career. And so you absolutely have to think of this. And you have to really understand who this person is, what their values are, um, if you're gonna, if if they're gonna carry your brand on their shoulders, a little easier if you have a whole family of athletes. If one goes wrong, then okay, you can survive a Lance Armstrong yeah. or a you know whatever. Right. Um, so yeah, I absolutely thought about that, but but also at the time, going back to when I really reached out to him, that there was a lot, the sentiment was heavily positive around Gary. Now he's gotten bigger, your audience is bigger. You're gonna get a little bit more of the negative sentiment, but I, I still don't see a ton of it, and I think. His, his voice is so genuine, his message is so positive that if you really hate that message, then that probably says more about you than it says about him. Well and, said. And I also think that, um, you know, if you try, you know, that's a phrase, if you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. Or I say, if you try and stand for everything, you end up standing for nothing. I'd rather have a strong point of view and say, this is what we believe in. And, you know, I'd rather focus on the strength of people who buy into that than the negativity of those who don't yeah he's definitely uh his language and the way he does things is is different than a lot of other people and some people don't like but i mean if you've ever actually listened to anything he talks about he's very compassionate yeah. super empathetic you know he wants everybody to really just be happy actually i follow his wine club but they just came out with the empathy wine you yeah. know the well, wine is called empathy like yeah. it's like it, i could tell you from first-hand experience that it isn't Gary, when we talk about the sneaker business, he's really focused on us being successful. How do I make sure that you guys get what you need out of this? What can I do more? You know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a fake Instagram hustle. It's real. I mean, I've been on the other side of it where he and I are business partners and I see it. So, and, and that, you know, I didn't know that before I signed it. That's just luck. That part of it is luck that it played out like it did. Um, you know, obviously I did some good analysis up front, but sure. you, you can never really predict. So I think that's been really good for us. And so, you know, where's the future going with with signing on more entrepreneurs? Yeah. Are you guys looking to do this? We talked about a little bit about how you, know, you could sign on somebody for who's got you know millions of followers, yeah. and maybe they don't even fully oblige. Are you guys staying in the macro influencer realm, or are you going to jump into some micro influencers? Yeah, I, I think we've learned that getting one tweet from someone with five million followers does not move the needle. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't, okay? So it makes you feel good, but this stuff is rushing by so fast that you need to have someone who's really buying into what you're doing and authentically influencing people. Like, the influence is a verb, okay? So if I have two million followers, it doesn't mean I'm an influencer unless I'm actually convincing my audience to do something. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like. You're an influencer only if I'm saying to you like, hey, I got this drink you should try. It's really good, you'd love it. Now I'm influencing you. If I'm a popular person, that doesn't make me an influencer. And it's only if I actually try the drink. It's an active do, thing, yeah. right. So, so or tell sticking, people about sticking it. one tweet is not influencing anybody. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like we, we are underplaying what, we've set such a low bar for the word influence. Okay, now Gary's influencing people because every day he's talking about something consistently and um, you know, maybe now I listen and be like, oh, I can buy into that, you know. Uh, maybe I'll try his wine because um, I, I believe in him. You know, I think the, the kind of X factor of influence is this little goodwill thing. Is there certain people out there who you want to be successful? You know, there's certain people like I'll look at and go, oh, they're famous. I'm interested in what they're doing, like Kanye, okay. He's a magnet for attention. But I don't really want to help him. Personally, I'm it's like different. I'm fascinated by him, but I'm yeah. not going to give him any. I'm not going to give him anything because I want him to succeed. I might relate to him like that. Where there's other people who have a smaller audience. If they say, "Hey, I've come out with this project," I'm like, "I support you. I'm in." Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's why Gary's able to sell sneakers and to sell wine is because his audience want to give him value back. 
And so okay. this goodwill factor is like totally underappreciated or underrecognized as what makes somebody, what makes two influencers, one good and one bad. And, you know, just about building a brand, I think that's the goodwill that you're talking about, the authenticity that you're talking yeah. about. Those are really big keys to building a, a, a solid brand, brand with really good engagement. Yeah. What else are you guys doing? You know, I know you're doing a lot of different things with the podcast and the show yeah. to show transparency. Yeah. What else are you guys doing to be able to, to build that brand and, and engagement in the community really at yeah. large? Yeah, community is the key word. I'm glad you said that because it used to be traffic. Okay, so I've been in marketing for many years and, uh, and it was all about traffic. How many eyeballs can I drive? Okay, so then it sort of became... I want to drive an audience, and it was all about content. Okay, so don't just drive an audience to a picture, now entertain the audience. Right. But I think the real game is community, is this area of now is it bi-directional value that's being exchanged and a relationship that's built with people that's personal to people, not just the, not just the product, okay? So, um, and, and someone said this the other day, I can't, I can't remember who it was, it wasn't my idea, but it was said, it's not how many people come, it's who stays. That's the difference between traffic and community, okay? And it's the people who stay that are gonna make or break your brand. The reason that they stay is if they're emotionally connected. And the way you can be emotionally connected is when the brand is not just talking about shoes, but saying, hey, we stand for inspiring and outfitting entrepreneurs. And let me interview an entrepreneur and bring that content to you and give, give that value to you. Now someone's like, wow, I listen to K-Swiss because they bring stories to me about other inspiring entrepreneurs. Okay, so now I've got an emotional connection with them. Um, so there's a reason we're doing things like the podcast and also a little bit about brand, is about brand transparency. It's like, let's show people who we are as people. You know, and I, and, and I think that's a little bit of a differentiator against our biggest competition. So. Again, another competitive strategy is to use your opponent's strengths as against them. Mm -hmm. So I could say, man, I'm never going to beat these big brands because they're so much bigger than me. That's, a, that's their competitive advantage. But if I'm transparent and nimble and fast and give you access into our team, man, now my small size is an advantage because they can't do that because their PR team's not going to sign off on it. And, you know, I made a podcast studio here. I just did it on my own. I didn't ask anybody, I just did it, and I bought the stuff off Amazon, the foam, and I made it, and everyone came in the next day and was like, oh, we have a podcast studio. Yeah, it's an awesome studio, could, by the way. I gotta congratulate you. you, great stuff Thank in there. Thank you, but yeah. you, you understand, you couldn't do that in a big corporation. Right, you have to get 45 people to sign off. Okay, so if you're a small company, don't just look at your, the competition as, oh, they're much bigger than me, I've got no chances. Use, make their weight count against them. And for me, brand transparency and access is one of the ways that our size can be an advantage. Because the more you get to know us, whether it's Omar who runs our social media or Patrick, our head of marketing, or Homie who is one of our designers who have strong social followings, their social personalities on their own outside of K-Swiss, the more you get to know them, the more you're gonna understand like, wow, I love this brand because yeah. the people who are in it. So I'm trying to put them on the pedestal as much as, and tell their stories, because it's not about vanity, it's about, I believe that's how brands have to, can get emotional connections with consumers, and when you do that, you build community, which is the, one of the biggest currencies now of brand building, in my opinion. Absolutely, you know, it's funny about your community. I had a few minutes with Omar before we got here, and yeah. you know, you brought him on, and he's a very entrepreneurial in spirit and For had his sure. own business and you guys brought him in. Yep. Um, and he said something interesting, which was that a lot of the people in here have that entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. They really want to grow this company and they have ownership. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, is that something you, you look for when you hired them or is it something you guys instill in the I culture? I am now, yeah, I am now. I think also the other interesting thing is, you know, we were on, you know, this brand was on its knees. You know, we were in survival mode two, three years ago. I mean, three years ago, 2016 was like survival mode. And I asked my, um, the, the, our investors, who's our ownership company, like, how long do I have? You, you gave me this job. I appreciate it. How long do I have to get something done? They said a year. Wow. So you had a deadline. If you well, didn't do it, it, it was, was unofficially said, whispered in my ear, you got a year. I said, level with me. You have a year. Okay. Well, immediately you become an entrepreneur. All right. And the pressures are on and I think that's probably the best thing that happened to me is that somebody said that because it made me go immediately into high 
change mode. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So it didn't, oh, let's just play this out and try this. It was like, pull the emergency alarm. Everything's got to change today. I've got 12 months or I'm out of my ear. So I love that because I, one of the things is sometimes people go, uh, you know, how do you accomplish your goals and how do you do so much at all at the same time? And I always look at goals and sometimes you have a 10 year goal and you're like, yeah, no, I, I'd love to build K-Swiss to a billion dollar company maybe, yeah. right? And somebody goes, you have 12 months or it's over. Yeah. Your, your, your entire company, we're just, we're getting rid of it. It focuses basically. you real quick. I exactly. tell you that. And, 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 it, and it was ultimately really good for me. I would say that was probably the one thing that uh, didn't feel good at the time. <laughs> but it's course. the reality of anyone who's in business in a, at a high level, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, is that's the truth. You operate with that pressure. And if you don't like it, get out of it. Yeah. Okay, so I put myself in that position, so I'm good with it. But it was great tactic for, for, for them to tell me that because it really got me focused. At that time, being in survival mode, you take, you know, to some degree, I didn't have a huge, really high bar on personnel because... You, you, you're warning people that it's not a good situation for people. It's a survival situation. There's layoffs. There's budget cuts. Right. Now we've got a bit of mojo. Uh, you, you could be a bit more, um, a bit more selective. So now I'm recruiting for that kind of personality type for sure, because you need believers. You need entrepreneurs to make a brand like this work. Um, it, you, you can't have any baggage. You can't have someone 50% in. You need, you need everyone to be 100% on board to have any chance of succeeding. When, if you respect our competition as much as we do, they're gonna run us over with ease if we're not the best we can be every day. Yeah. Um, so I don't need people saying like, hey, when, what, when's my job title changing? Or I need people come in and be like, how do I win today? You know, how do I, that, that's the people I need. And I feel like I've got that now. And that's almost just the same thing you're saying yourself as, as an entrepreneur running this company. You're saying, you know, how can I win today? Because especially for that first year, if you lose, you know, you might lose everything. Yeah. And so you have to make yeah. sure you're, you're And winning. I feel like that's a rolling 12 months, by the way. That's the way <laughs> I operate. It's like that didn't end after the year. It's like yeah. a, we have a long way to go before we get to where we're trying to be. I think we've got some nice shoots growing up here and our results have turned around. We have a nice year this year. We have a long way to go. We no, by no means made it. We, you know, this is a live case study, not a case study of after the fact we're in the middle of it you know so you know be grateful for what you have but still hustle for what you want right? for sure yeah. for sure yeah exactly and i mean we don't celebrate the wins that much because i always feel like we're still we're not where we need to be but you know we'll 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 take 30 seconds to say we had a good year and then we'll move on to 19 <laughs> and you've turned it around a lot i mean since 2016 and that's probably when i when you signed gary v and that's yeah. when I started hearing about it and then got yeah, more sales. Yeah, we'll be profitable this year for the first time in many years. Congrats. We've turned around a big loss into a decent profit. We are double-digit revenue growth globally. Um, so there's definitely some good signs financially. But like I said, we, you know, we're, we're a long way from where we feel like this brand is, can, can be. And so we're, we're, we're still pushing real hard. And, and just looking at you know, what some common mistakes, maybe mistakes you guys have even made along the path, uh, what are the, some of the most common mistakes people do around trying to build the brand and that causes them to ultimately fail? Um, and how do you learn from that? What do you, anything you learn from that? Yeah, I think you've got to be really, um, uh, you've got to really focus on what the market's doing and not rely on just your own worldview or your gut feel. You know, like I yeah. think we've learned lessons and we, we operated like that for a bit. And we learned some hard lessons around pricing, for example, something that you wouldn't necessarily look at that closely. You know, when we, you talk about 30,000 foot branding, we've talked about branding a lot and emotional brand connection. You've also got to get real tactical. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for example, our pricing was slightly, in a key channel, slightly above Adidas at one point. And no one had really noticed that until one of our sales reps was like, wait a minute, how are we going to win if we're, slightly more expensive than a competitor that's way stronger than us yeah. with a comparable product. And we were like, good point. That's crazy. You know, and we made the change. So we learned that lesson that you've got, and, and you've got to be in the market, seeing what's going on, analyzing it and reacting really fast all the time. Uh, okay. So there's one, there's one yeah. little example. Have you experienced any big failures and how do you deal with failure yourself? 
Um, yeah, we've we've experienced a lot of failures. Most I, successful people have, right? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not I'm not somebody who loves you know. Yeah, you know, people are like I love failure. You know, Gary's like I love failing and fail fast. I mean, I, I don't. You know, I, I don't yeah. like losing. I never have. Um, but I've done <laughs> I've done my share of it. I think yeah, we made a lot of mistakes in this journey. I think the key is um, you know don't make it twice. So. If you make if something goes wrong, that's okay to do it once, but understand what what happened and and make the right changes, and also have Plan Bs, you know, and and pivot, be able to pivot fast. So you only know if you made a mistake if you're measuring, mm -hmm. what I'm talking about by being in the market yeah. and really measuring on a constant basis. Otherwise, you could be wrong and not know it for 12 months. You've got to know it as soon as you can, and then you've got to have the the kind of the guts to to change it really fast, you know, to make that price change or to, you know, I, you know sometimes you fall in love with things that are your idea totally. and you, you, <laughs> you don't want to let them go. And you've got to, sometimes you've got to cut things off that even you, you came up with yeah. really hard to do, but you've got to make that change fast. And someone said to me, um, you've got to act like a doctor, not a parent, hmm. you know, and a doctor, yeah. well, a doctor reads symptoms unemotionally and prescribes a fix. A parent doesn't read symptoms unemotionally. They sugarcoat things. They gotcha. give too much, you know, oh, my Timmy is, uh, that's not him. He will never do that. And, you know, I'm going to get, you know, you, yeah. you just, you, you're wearing rose tinted glasses and you're not making the best decision, you're making emotional decisions, not factual decisions. And so by being a, by acting like a doctor, it means act unemotionally when it comes to um, analyzing the success or failure of projects. And if something's not working, admit it's not working. Really hard to do. Yeah. And I think that's one mistake we made is we were sort of emotionally hanging on to something we just really wanted to work and it wasn't. And we didn't admit it was. People said like, that's not working. I'm like, no, no, it's working, it's working. I, I think uh, it's funny because like I'm definitely, that I learned the hard way. Yeah. And one of the things is when, when you fail, it's not that you are a failure. You have to kind of understand that sometimes small goals that you have that you might fail at, what is the underlying motivation or inspiration for you to do that? Yeah. You know, for me, if if I were to fail at, you know, doing a podcast, well, the underlying motivation was to help other people and, and there's a lot of other stuff, but I yeah. really like the podcast medium. I committed to two years, so I'm like, I prevented failure yeah. right there for yeah. at least two years. But the whole thing is that my message is what I'm trying to get out there. So I do, you know, motivational speaking. I always find some other way to pivot to do it. Yep. Um, and for me, I've never looked at failure as I am a failure. It's not who I am. It's right. just something that I, I learned from. But making that decision quickly allows you to take more action faster. Exactly. And get more done. Look, it's easy to go on Instagram and see 10 really successful people. Okay. What you're not seeing is the million people who are like getting crushed and, and soul destroyed and failing and not, you know, working, you know, three jobs to try and put food on the table and it's not succeeding or they're burning through their money. Yeah. No one's putting that shit on Instagram, okay? So we also are in this little bit of a false, um, you know, world where we think everybody's doing great and, and it's easy to, to win. It's not, you know, it's years and years in many cases. Most people you see who are successful uh, years, you know, you see Gary Vee, wow, he came out of nowhere. Yeah, he came out of nowhere after 10 years of earning, you know, 30 to 50 grand a year working in a liquor store or, right. you, don't, you know what I'm saying? Like most people who are succeeding, you don't see the backstory. It's like the band that suddenly has a number one hit. You're like, wow, they're a one hit wonder. You didn't see them touring in really like bad pubs for many years. Yeah, the exactly. Beatles were played seven days a week, 12 hours a day. People wouldn't sign them. They said they were horrible. And all of a sudden, yeah, they're the best catches, ever. Right, right? best and ever. It's like, what happened? Oh, you know, they got this one hit song and that was it. No, they put in the work. Yeah, if they can do it, then what about, why am I not, why is my band not doing well? Well, how much, you know, how much blood, sweat and tears have you put in? And it's, like I said, it's very easy to, to see, to, to make it seem like the, the bar of success is low, and it isn't, yeah. is the bottom line. And I think so also don't beat too. yourself up about it. You know, that, that's, that's my right. message here. It's not yeah. trying to demotivate people. It's saying, like, keep going. You know, yeah. these are, I call it, you know, K-Swiss will be a, an overnight success that took 10 years. That's good. And I think, too, people expect it to happen now. Yeah. I'm very much like that. I want it to happen now, yeah, but I realize... Sure. 
and I, Gary Vee actually says this a lot, is like, uh, micro speed, macro patience. But for me too, I'm always trying to get as much done as possible, but yeah. understanding that, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, understanding that as I, I shifted careers and, you know, from orthodontics to more of an entrepreneur, yeah. I'm still an orthodontist, but as I did that, it took me 10 years to become an orthodontist. Right. It wasn't easy, it wasn't fast in any way. So the fact that I spent the last five years of my life transitioning into different things, it, I'm not surprised, yeah. but it's really hard for people to stay motivated. Um, and actually, you know, you, as you're going through this and you've been hit with some self-doubt and you know, f trying to convince other people to do it and then yeah. convince consumers and everybody else, how do you stay motivated? Uh, I think, you know, I've, I've thought about this a lot, actually, and I think there's a couple of things is I have, a, I have a, a natural anxiety strain in me, okay, which if you understand anxiety, it's always worrying about the future or what's coming next. So I, I'm not casual about like, ah, everything will be okay. It's like if I don't succeed today, my future could be in jeopardy. You know what I mean? I'm going to have a hard, I'm going to struggle in the future if I don't get it today. So I'm always really conscious about doing my best. And that comes from, you know, a, from, from not, you know, that, that's a, a negative thing in, in essentially, but, but really right. it's, a, I think it's a bit of a power if controlled in the right way. So, so mm -hmm. I've obviously, I've definitely thought about this and realized I could love to tell you a great story about why I'm so relentlessly um, pushing my whole career and why I'm driven. And, and some of it's probably the fact that I have anxiety, a controlled anxiety, but I have it. So that's number one. And number two is I'm hyper competitive. And again, that's not always a good thing. If you have a, my competitive nature as a kid, I was awful to play sports against. I was that kid that was too competitive and was like nasty. Yeah. And I wasn't also, I wasn't that good at sports. So it, I, <laughs> It's one thing if I was... <laughs> if you were good, it'd be a yeah, little bit no, no, better. No, 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 I wasn't that good, but I just, you know, I was hyper-competitive. I'm sure that is a driver. Is like, and I don't know where that's from, or it doesn't matter where it's from, but it's just that is a factor in me, is like, I don't like to lose, and I, wanna, I don't like giving up. So you've got to have a bit of that in you as well. So With anxiety, interesting that you brought that up as your motivator. So uh, I've been doing a lot more things outside of my box, outside of my comfort yeah. zone. And... Um, I was explaining to how I felt to a friend of mine who's a full-blown entrepreneur for years. And he's like, oh yeah, I have anxiety all the time. Yeah. And I was like, what? Yeah. I don't have anxiety. You know what? If I switch the words around a little bit, can I focus that anxiety? Understanding that I'm worried about what's happening in the future. Yeah. Like you said, controlling it yeah. and then pushing it as an energy force into doing more action. Yeah, and and then it, you know it, then it becomes a power because you're going to out because if you're you're out thinking everyone, you know the you know people with anxiety don't like unknowns, so you yeah. over plan so that there aren't any. Okay, so you always are the one on the traveling who knows where you're going, where what's booked, what where how you're going to get from the airport. You know, da 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 da. Your wheels are always turning. Right. Well, that's a pretty good thing to have when you're in a in business because you're constantly you know, looking into the future about what's happening. It can be super negative if you let it override everything. So, you know, I think Eckhart Tolle from The Power of Now is, you know, you know, rides on my, you know, is, is, is riding the journey with me because that, that's really created a good balance. And I got it, I, I'm fine, I don't suffer from it. I wouldn't say I suffer from it at all. I have done in my past, but. For someone else who might be suffering, like what is something you do to control it? Well, I've just learned to sort of live in this moment. You know, I think that's the key is, you know, anything that's, um, that you're thinking about the future is made up. It's mm -hmm. not real. You're right. guessing. Hundred yeah. percent. I, I can't tell you what's going to happen in five minutes. So what? So if I worry about what might happen in five minutes, I'm, and then and then create a scenario and, and that concerns me of you know yeah. not only am I, I'm going to worry about what's coming, but I'm going to come up with the worst case scenario and think that's probably what's going to happen. That's what we always okay, do, so right? Not, right. So as long as you understand that that's fake and the only truth is what's happening in this moment. This is the only truth. Um, then that's how you that's how you do it, and you've got to study it. You've got to do like Headspace. You know, go on uh, the App Store, yeah. sign up for Headspace, do ten minutes every day. Um, it's transformative, and then the power of now as a book is an umbrella kind of philosophy behind some of those practical things you'll do in Headspace. Uh, Headspace just is a fun, you know, ten minutes of relaxation. Yeah. The power of now tells you kind of why you're doing that. Uh, the combination of those two things, I think, are trans can be transformative if you, Excellent. If you yeah. really want it. 
I think I'd say is like, if you're listening to this podcast and especially if you're still listening after we've been blabbing all this time, then you, you, you're on the right path. Like you're investing in yourself, you're studying, you're listening, you're learning. Like most people aren't. Most people are just gonna sit and complain about why things aren't working for them. You're one of the few people that's actually trying to kind of add to your arsenal of skills or motivation. So you're already way ahead. I love that. And as we wrap up, I was wondering what is the best piece of advice you can give to people out there, you know, trying to focus their brand and build their community? Well, I guess, you know, thematically I'd say, you know, look for uh, the open space. You know, that that's probably some of the most powerful things I've probably done. Um, you know, it's a little 30,000 foot, but it is important is, you know, really understand, um, you know, what it is that you're the only one at, you know, find something that is an open lane for you and keep working until you can position yourself into something unique and, and, and lean in on that. You know, uh, there's another expression I've used a lot, which is if you can't be first, be different. Um, you know, so I think that's really important. So, and, and I think sometimes people just bypass that stuff and go straight to the, to the product. Um, and, and it's worth spending the time on setting up that big picture before you go too far down the path. I really, really like that. I appreciate it. Mm. Um, you know, I, I can't leave this interview without asking just, you know, how would somebody as an entrepreneur get involved with, with K-Swiss? And you guys are going to be hiring, you know, more influencers and yeah. entrepreneurs. If, sure. like I, I mentioned earlier, but I have this, I'm going to drive over here. I had this vision for all these different shoe sneakers, and I thought they would be really cool. <laughs> and, and I got this phrase, inspire, impact, and empower, which is something that's really motivating to me. I have a neon sign of it that my, my family made for me for my 30th birthday, actually, because yeah. um, I believe that uh, you need to get inspired to do something. Yeah. And then when you're inspired, you go make an impact on your own life, yeah. and then you're able to empower others with what you've learned sure. so that they can do the same. Are you pitching uh, me a sneaker right now? I, no, I, I mean, if, <laughs> if it was supposed to be in 15 to 20 seconds, that was it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so if somebody like me... I know wanted, what you're doing. Yeah, yeah don't worry. No, I think... Uh, look, the, the, the bottom line of, of collaboration is, is you've got to bring an audience. To the you've got to bring value to the table. Okay? Right. So this is... I'm not talking about you specifically. Anyone what is it that you're bringing to the brand you want to collaborate with that they don't have themselves? That could be an audience, it could be credibility in an area or, or you know, uh, some sort of cultural area that you're an expert in. Um, but, but ultimately these is largely audience, you yeah. know? So I think for me, as I'm looking, first thing I'm looking at is, okay, who's, who wants to work with us and do, uh, do they have a highly engaged audience that's at a size that's worth me getting involved with? Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't have to be millions at this point, because we know that macro influencers who are, who are not, you know, relentlessly influencing are not as good as a small guy who's really buys into what you're doing. Who's the audience? How engaged are they? And what value are you bringing to the table? That, that's the key. People often ask me like, hey, I want to do a shoe and I go look at their Instagram. They got like, you know, 500 followers. I'm like, get to a few tens of thousands. Yeah build your audience and the way you do that is by creating great value for them mm -hmm. that's how you generate an audience and then once you build that then come then come and people actually will probably come to you nice uh so you guys are are actually going to be actively looking for other entrepreneurs to start some new lines is that like in that's the that's the vision sure i mean in the same way that other brands have athlete families we will have an entrepreneur family oh that's really exciting yeah really really exciting um, you know, Barney, this has been amazing. I want to ask you, where can we all find you online? Uh, well, obviously, K-Swiss, uh, all the regular channels. We have, uh, you know, um, our Facebook page. We put a lot of our content there. Obviously, our Instagram, YouTube. We have a show called Inside K-Swiss where we show video of the stuff we're doing in the building. Uh, our podcast, which is CEOs Wear Sneakers on Apple Podcasts. You can find that there. And then myself, I'm on um, Instagram at Barney Waters or LinkedIn, uh, I'm a bit more active on there now as well, so. Awesome. Get me anywhere, reach out, I usually reply. I'm not very famous, so I don't have, a, don't have too many followers that I can't reply, so. I, well, you're doing an amazing job, and I'm sure as, as you continue to build your brand, you're gonna become more and more famous yourself uh, because of all the amazing things you're doing. The last question is, you've achieved incredible success turning this company around over the last two and a half, three years. For you, what is the next level of success? I wanted this to be a sustained growth, sustained profitability. I think, you know, turning, you know, turning around once is you, you've got to like 
live with it for a bit to make sure it's sustainable and momentum builds and you know eventually when that you know once you go over that tipping point the momentum r- runs itself and you you end up keeping up with it i think w- once that momentum is going on its own is i'll, I'll feel i'll feel like okay we're, we're getting somewhere so we're, we're, the story is not done here on what we're doing and uh, you know maybe at some point down the line i'll look for another one to fix we'll see awesome <laughs> well thanks so much for coming on unleash success my pleasure thanks for having me If you guys enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that we have is please go subscribe.